Uh, so what do we do? We want to apply the implicit function theorem. What do we do? Uh, we are only looking at the scalar case here by the way. We have assumed that A and B are scalars for this proof. You can also do the vector proof but I am just keeping uh, the uh, discussion simpler by assuming scalar A and scalar B. Okay, Which means what? That the uh, essentially means that your states are scalar states. Okay, Alright. So, uh, what do I do? I basically write this as a function. This is the idea. This is that function. Okay. I, you will see why. If you look at this function, it is a function of a, b and z. Okay. You already know the a, b. I have used the same notation. There it was a, x, b, x. Here it is a, b. I have for the moment assumed that a and b are independent variables themselves and uh, the x dependence I have forgotten. Yeah. It is actually irrelevant. So, we do not write the x dependence of anything because that way a is dependent on x, b is dependent on x and z is also dependent on x. But the fact is when I write this expression, x does not explicitly appear anywhere. This is just a function of a and b. right? So, I, I leverage that to just forget the x dependence and I write a function h. Okay? And this function is bz square minus 2az minus bq equal to 0. Why did I write this? Because the solution of that is this guy. If I solve for z, you see this is a quadratic in z, right? Quadratic function in z. If I equate it to 0 and I solve for z, this is exactly the expression I will get. This is the control uh, except for the negative sign. Hmm? Again, negative sign is irrelevant. Positive is smooth, then the negative is smooth. Huh? So, this is actually the expression for the control in the scalar case, right? So, that is why this h has been chosen, not chosen by some magic or anything, pretty straightforward. Hmm? All right. So, what do we say? We consider this function h of a, b and z, three variables. It does not matter. Like I said, this x and y were different dimensions. So, I can club these two as one variable and this as one variable. Pretty simple. Huh? Does not matter. Okay. This is a scalar function of three variables equated to 0. Now, I also consider the set S in R2, which is the set of all A, B, except this. Why do you think I removed this point, this, this particular uh, region, if you may? Why do you think I removed this from set S or from R2? This is a case that cannot occur by the CLF definition. cannot occur by the CLF definition, right? Because if B is 0, A has to be negative or whatever, yeah? That is the CLF requirement, yeah? So, although I have forgotten that they have a function of x, but I have to remember that there is a CLF requirement. So, CLF requirement says that if B is 0, A has to be negative. So, this is not a case that can appear. Therefore, I ignore this region. What is that region? So, essentially it is this entire blue thing that I have drawn except for this axis, the right half. Huh? So, this is the right half, this, this entire line is not there, everything else is there in this set S. Okay? Clear? Okay, great, great. So, now I have essentially solved this, okay? solved this equation and now I can write this as tuples, what is 3 tuple. Yeah? a, b and z as a function of a, b. Okay? This is the from the implicit to the explicit. This is the implicit and this is the explicit version. Okay? Here what? z, a, b is defined as 0 when b is 0 and z, a, b is defined as this guy when b is non-zero. Okay? Exactly the universal formula for the scalar case. Okay? Exactly the universal formula for the scalar case. Now what? Pretty simple. I, I compute the, here I needed to do del f del y. In this case, I need to do the, take the Jacobian with respect to z. Huh? This is the Jacobian. I hope you are used to this. Hmm? It is basically 
taking partial with respect to multiple variables when you take then it's a jacobian so here i'm still taking with respect to one variable but still i would use the word jacobian okay because you will use it in several places in the future so what is it i take partial with respect to this y variable in this case the y variable is actually the z in this case yeah because i am writing y as gx right so therefore this is partial with respect to z that i have to verify what is that it is just twice bz minus twice a yeah okay and now i compute it for these two cases okay so twice bz minus twice a so when b is equal to 0 is just twice minus twice a right if b is equal to 0 this guy is gone okay? but when b is non zero i have to substitute z here in terms of a b because these are my independent variables if you may i am resolving in terms of a and b so when b is non zero i substitute z here and i get this guy okay and i get this guy okay the good thing to z is i have mentioned that this is non zero for all a b in s but actually it's positive okay. is actually positive for all a b in s because this is positive this is also positive because i've chosen the positive one i mean that's just notation here okay so but the important thing is non zero which is what we require full rank in this case full rank is just non zero scalar the scalar right the jacobian is a scalar so full rank is non zero huh? and it is so i can immediately invoke the implicit functions theorem to say that zab is the unique solution further zab is smooth the only thing we need to note is that when definition 2.7 holds your a and b are always in the set s that is if you have a clf then your ab are always in the set s okay so therefore on this set s i've already shown that zab is a unique smooth solution okay on this set s this zab that we have is a unique smooth solution so this is a very uh, by the way this is a, in in general mathematics analysis and all this is a very standard way of proving smoothness okay this is how we do it using implicit function theorem somebody asked me to prove smoothness of some solution or something just think at the back of your mind think that implicit function theorem has to be invoked okay so then you then the only uh, big creativity here is constructing this sort of a function that's the creativity here that i constructed this function because the solution of this function gives me the universal control formula in this case in a different context it might give me something else so the only creativity required is to construct this smartly once you do that all you have to prove is that uh, the solution is what you are looking to prove to be smooth and the jacobian is or the derivative or the first partial is non zero or, or full rank that's it okay and we've done that okay all right anyway continuity at the origin is anyway consequence of the small control property so we are not you know concerned about it remember that this analysis is not for the origin itself because these conditions are stated as if x is not equal to 0 all the clf definitions are essentially saying if x is not equal to 0 this happens x is not equal to 0 yeah so they are not for the origin so the continuity at origin is basically from the small control property okay nothing else that's the idea all right excellent let's try some i mean i'm also going to try with you yeah how we can construct some clfs and then we try to get some controls out of it and so on and so forth okay all right so we start with simple things hmm. this system okay we've been doing this working with i mean i've shown you different forms of this system without the control now i'm giving you something with the control it's a double integrator it's a double integrator dynamics very relevant because a lot of mechanical systems can be reduced to double integrators okay all right position and velocity states derivative of second state is acceleration 
and typically acceleration is what you control ok. So, very simple connection with mechanical systems. What do you think will be, what do you think I should choose as my V as my control Lyapunov function? So, do you remember what we chose as a uh, uh, of x1 square plus x2 square? Uh, let us let us revise for ourselves the CLF definition uh, so that we do not. What do we want with the CLF? It has to be first of all this right that it is a candidate Lyapunov function. This is too easy, yeah. <laughs> Most functions we choose as CLFs. Uh, the next one is if the contribution of the control terms are 0, then we want the um, drift vector term to be strictly negative uh, for all non-zero states, all non-zero states this has to be. At zero state this can be zero no problem, nobody cares because you are already at the equilibrium. But when the state is non-zero this has to give a negative contribution. This is what is this requirement for a CLF. Okay. So, let us keep that in mind when we try to design. Okay, fine. Let us try this simple one. What is it? Let us try half x1 square plus x2 square. Okay. Half x1 square plus x2 square. So, what do we do? We try to find the, um, first of all what is the drift vector field here? What is the drift vector field? We will do all the competitions formally. Huh? There is a quick way also, but I will not do the quick way. See the quick, I will tell you what is the quick way. Quick way is compute v dot. Uh, then you have x1 x1 dot the way we are doing earlier x2 x2 dot this is x1 x2 plus x2 times u. So, whatever multiplies uh, v dot is a this is bx this is the simple quick way and if you want to do the longer way you have to write f0 x f1 x del v del x and all that ok, but this is the quick way. Yeah, because if you see this is how it is comes out to be right every time you see this expression right here this guy this expression is illustrative enough. So, this v dot is always a x plus b transpose u. So, using this I can always compute a and b ok and what do I want for a CLF? I want that what is the CLF requirement now? Yeah, well, first of all, it is a candidate Lyapunov function anyway. So, yeah, I mean, that is oops, 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 what do I do? Hmm. that is done. I want what? What is my requirement for CLF? Second condition in terms of A and B, in terms of A and B, because I have written already A and B, right? for all x not equal to 0, I need what? Yeah, if, if b of x is actually 0, then a of x has to be negative, ok. If b of, b of x is actually 0, then a of x has to be strictly negative, ok. Let us investigate. This requires investigation. B of x 0 implies what in our case? It implies x 2 is 0, ok. That is the only way that B of x is exactly 0 and this implies what? That x 1 x 2 is also 0 which is equal to A of x, right. And this is a problem, right? It is not negative, right? Not negative right? because it is actually 0, a of x turns out to be actually 0. So, not a CLF, not a CLF, disappointing. Hmm? Not a CLF. Such a simple example we started with, we failed here. So annoying. Do you, do you huh? How? see you, you understand that what do we need? We need that whenever bx is 0, the, 
the a has to be negative strictly negative for all non zero x hmm? so when is b zero when x2 is zero only way for b to be zero is x2 zero is in fact if and only if right right there is no other way about it now i want a to be negative but let me see what happens to a a is x1 times x2 so whatever is x1 it is irrelevant even for non zero x1 this is zero which means a is exactly zero but i want a to be negative okay so this is a problem so this function is not a clf now what do any of you remember all the modifications in vi i did for that when we analyze this kind of a system we analyze this kind of a system what what is a good control by the way for this system anybody remembers we did this no i mean i didn't write the u i didn't use the letter u but i gave some system a double integrator system linear double integrator what was it in the second dimension what is the control you would give for this system to stabilize you think hmm? minus x1 minus x2 this is the damper spring mass damper so go back to spring mass damper okay like remember a target system and try to match it with the target system my target system is spring mass damper so i just give you as minus x1 minus x2 that seem to work do you remember what kind of lepno function i used to prove that that the system was stable in that case it was complicated not very straightforward it was not straightforward you if you remember x1 square plus x2 square did not work because it's not a strictly apno function okay i do this hmm? i do this anyway i will see what happens i am not sure what happens but yeah so i compute v dot again we will try the simpler way of doing thing so this x2 plus x1 times x2 dot plus x1 dot which is u plus x2 right plus x1 x1 dot which is x1 x2 right okay i have just computed the derivative and substituted things now i know that everything multiplying u is the b and everything not multiplying u is the a and so what is the ax in this case ax is x1 x2 twice x1 x2 in fact plus x2 squared ha huh? okay and uh, bx is right it is x1 plus x2 okay okay so we do the same analysis again hmm? for all x non zero what happens if same thing i rewrite bx is zero we need ax to be negative right now when is bx in this case zero x1 equals minus x2 correct correct okay now this implies what 2x1 x2 plus x2 square is actually equal to what if i substitute x2 equals minus x1 or x1 is minus x2 this minus x2 square now which ever one you can write either one huh this is equal to ax and this is negative because x is non zero right right is negative okay so this is good yeah yes they have a green tick yes yeah this is a clf if you look back at your notes and you check out what we did for this spring mass damper example x1 dot is x2 x2 dot is minus k1 x1 minus k2 x2 just the k1 k2 scaling was there this is exactly this and yeah, we had this kind of a function okay 
So, you know that this, this is not a strictly Aponoff function. Okay. So, this is not a CLF either. Okay. CLF is something more. A CLF lets you choose a control. Yeah, in this case, you would not have been able to choose a control. Okay, which will show you stabilization with the Lyapunov function. Of course, with Lasalle invariance, yes. But entire the entire idea of CLF is based on Lyapunov theorems and Lyapunov functions, not on Lasalle invariance. Lasalle invariance, as you remember, is a more very general sort of a result. It cannot does not align with how the Lyapunov theorems go. Lyapunov theorem. You, you can just recall how the proof of Lyapunov theorems went, how the proof of Lasalle invariance went. Zero connection between the two. Yeah, zero connection, like completely world apart. In fact, for Lasalle invariance, you don't even need to start with the positive definite v. That's not a requirement. Positive definite v is not a requirement. Yeah. So, so these rely on Lyapunov theorems. Therefore, wherever the Lyapunov theorem fails, it will not turn out to be a CLF. It will be something different. Okay, it will be a, uh, it has to be a CLF, yeah. So, in this case, this is what is a CLF, okay. So, I think I, that is why I have given you, okay, I gave you a nice hint for this system. This is, this is a small extension of what we did, okay. So, this is how you, this is the procedure though, or I mean, um, of course, choosing this is still, you know, a little bit of a guesswork. But uh, this is a lot of procedure, how you check, okay. Now, now, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, it is not like, yeah, there is no easy path there. If I give you a problem, I will give you a hint. Huh? Also, can you guys just tell me or, or try to guess without going into what I gave you as a, another V, huh? forget what I gave you as another V. Do you do you folks think you can guess what I can add here? Suppose, let us see, notice that this pieces are inside this V, right? x2 square plus x1 square is also here, right? There are some additional terms, that is all. So, forget what I gave. Can you add some term here to make it a CLF to this guy? Mixed terms are allowed. So, so remember, how are we? So, this is one nice hint I will give you that we are typically choosing Lyapunov functions as quadratic forms, right. I mean, we remember we made this equivalence. If you have a positive definite matrix, then you have a positive definite function. So, therefore, Lyapunov functions can be those quadratic forms. So, your V is can be typically in this form x transpose Px. Now, we have exploited a very small now, what do we need? We need that uh, hmm. so what do we need? We need that this p be positive definite. Correct. We need this p to be positive definite. All right. Now we this is a very very simple example of this, right? It is just one in the diagonals and zeros here. Huh? Too simple. And I can have more complicated versions where I have something in the diagonals. But still, this is positive definite, right? All I have to do is check the determinant, right? For this two by two case, I just have to take the check the determinant. Pretty easy, right? So, for the two dimensional case, all I need is this is positive, this is positive, and the determinant is positive. That's it. So, so mixed terms are allowed. All I'm trying to say is mixed terms are allowed as long as the magnitude of the mixed term is small. Okay. Now, do you think that will help us? Huh? Not an x2 square term. See the, see the only thing I can add here is a mixed term. I can tell you that. There is no other. Yeah, because x2 square is anyway already there. So, what, huh. So, now suppose I add this alpha x1, x2 because this is the only other unique term I have. Of course, you can do funny things like sin x1, sin x2 and all that. That is up to you. I would not go there. I would start with these kind of things, huh? exponential x1, x2, one can probably think, maybe it will work also, I am not denying it, yeah. But I am saying you should start with this simple case and then try to add terms to it rather than try to guess this guy. This is coming from some fundamental logic, which I know, you do not know as of now, 
okay you, you will know soon but right now you don't know why this works okay so for you it's simple thing to add okay, some alpha x1 x2 suppose i did now what happens i add some terms in the derivative right so i'm going to delete this just to make some space for me so this is uh, plus what alpha x1 dot x2 plus alpha x1 x2 dot let's see if this works hmm? and then what alpha x1 dot x2 is alpha x2 square and this is alpha x1 u huh? already nice things have happened you see why now if bx now bx is not just this bx also has this okay so bx equal to 0 implies x2 is minus alpha x1 right x2 is minus alpha x1 okay now what do i get for ax in this case implies ax is what so you batao mere ko Min utna easy to nahi life it is minus alpha x1 square from here from the first term from this guy i will get alpha cubed plus alpha cubed x1 square right so if alpha is less than 1 i am done all right yeah so what is this this is basically minus alpha minus alpha cubed x1 square so if alpha is less than 1 i am good right and i can also sh i i believe um, if alpha is less than half ye positive definite rahega. this will remain positive definite huh? less than half whatever that's i mean uh, greater than 0 for all alpha what uh, 1 fourth minus alpha square 1 less than half this will work I hmm? am just computing the determinant it has half half and alpha by 2 alpha by 2 actually so it is 1 fourth minus alpha squared by 4 so alpha less than 1 did you just say that only oh thanks oops you were right alpha less than 1 works here also <laughs> and here also alpha less than 1 I apologize <laughs> sorry okay all right yeah yeah so alpha less than 1 works okay so all you need to do is alpha less than 1 all you need is add this one term whereas I added two terms I mean, I, whatever I made slightly more complicated things yeah so do not go by what I constructed you just add terms start with the usual quadratic simplest quadratic x1 square x2 square x3 square then you add terms you will get something okay it's not that bad and once you've constructed a clf okay you can construct a controller universal formula if nothing else works universal formula if you can't guess universal formula awesome right okay